Chapter 8, Connecting with Your Prospects. It's always best to be the first one to start a conversation with new prospects, whether they're ready to buy right away or not. You become the educator on the topic. You often get to set the pace of the conversation. You are known as the person who brought awareness to the problem, which has not been recognized before, and you help determine the best possible solution. When clients come to you first, you don't know what information they've already received and from where they received it. You may have had to battle preconceived notions about what your product or service offering actually is. You have to reset the conversation to focus on the impact of what the solution will provide and finally, what the reasonable expectations of the final result are, whether they choose us or someone else. One of the students in our KO Sales U was a master at marketing and generating inbound leads. However, before he took KO Sales U, he was terrible at the sales conversation. Prospects would contact James with questions about marketing, services, and online ad spend. The unfortunate reality was many of these prospects automatically believed spending money on Facebook ads and search engine optimization, SEO, generated guarantee results. He would struggle to explain to his prospects that they may spend hundreds or thousands of dollars without generating a single client. Some understood. Many more believed what they saw online from people posting statuses in their network and thought James wasn't good enough. James's first objection he had overcome in the sales cycle was getting prospects not to believe all the Facebook status hype that every dollar spent would automatically generate for in return. James would often lose the deal before ever actually getting the meeting. You may have spent one, two, or even more meetings navigating the client towards what real expectations versus any promises made from other unrealistic sources. When I worked for American Express, we dealt with a wide variety of clients, the most common being government agencies and international conglomerations. Because of the size of our transactions, we often had to compete in request for proposal RFP process. When an RFP came out, it was a multi-page document which asked a series of questions about our products and services, check boxes, whether we did certain things or not, and then finally the price. When we met a client before the RFP was released, we would have several conversations about what made us different and why those features were important to that particular client. When the RFP was then released, we would then easily see the impact of these conversations as certain questions were written in specifically for us to answer positively. Our initial conversation had impact. If we weren't involved with the client before the RFP was released, we would oftentimes tell which vendor was helping to craft the conversation. There were certain questions which felt directly, specifically for them. We made a conscious decision as a team to no longer respond to RFPs if we were not involved in the conversations before the RFP was released. It was a difficult decision. After all, as Wayne Gretzky said, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. RFPs would take a minimum of a full work week to put together. That was time well spent if we had a great chance of winning, but it was a massive risk if we didn't. In that same week, we could move other deals forward and connect with new prospects. We also knew most companies required a minimum number of responses before they were allowed to reward a contract. And by responding to risky RFP, we were helping the issuing company make a faster and easy decision to not choose us. By not responding, we might have a chance to connect with the company afterwards after the process failed and have conversations to see where we stood. I'm not saying don't respond to any RFP that is part of your business process. Oftentimes, junior companies will respond to every RFP they can as an awareness tactic. The more they get their name out there, whether they win or not, is valuable time spent for them. But do become strategic with initial client engagement. If the first time an RFP issuing company hears of your company is through a cattle call process, call it what it is. It's a method to get in touch with a prospect for the first time and spend your time accordingly. However, your company may be better suited spending that same amount of time connecting fresh with new prospects and carving your own conversations into fitting into theirs. Calling, emailing, and connecting on social media are great ways to make the connection. Just know what your chances are of getting the meeting with each method and spend your time strategically on the right ones at the right time. To call or email. When we cover calling for meetings in the KO Sales U program, people will often ask me if it's okay if they do the same thing with email. 
Calling a person or trying to get them live is not the same as sending electronic mail, hoping the three paragraphs of content is enough for the recipient to take the same high level action. Email, unlike connecting with someone on the phone, is considered a low value touch point. Think of what you do when you receive an email from a name you don't recognize. Chances are you will look at the name in the subject line and unless something jumps out at you, you will likely immediately delete it. If you do open it and it doesn't look like something you recognize, you may also unsubscribe yourself from the email list and then never be contacted by that person or company again. Our clients are no different. Salespeople and business owners typically prefer to email because it seems less invasive. Emails feel like it will be easier, but anything that may be easy also produces less results. As an entrepreneur, a business owner, and sales professional, you can choose the easy route or the one that will produce the biggest impact. Email is a low impact touch point for a client. It is far too easy to delete an email in an inbox. It is too easy to ignore it and never respond. Email should never be the number one method of communication with any prospect. It leaves too much out of the conversation. For me, I would much rather push myself out of my comfort zone and get better results than to spend my time working on something which is going to take longer to get to the final goal. However, don't think you shouldn't email at all when working to get connected with a prospect for the first time. Instead, email should be used strategically. It should be part of the one, two, and three punch. Email should either be used to connect with someone first to let them know you will be calling them at a specific time or to connect with someone outside of the respectable business hours. If you do choose to send email, spend more time on the subject line than the body of the email. Similar to the old philosophical question, if a tree falls in the woods and there's no one here to make it sound, does it make a sound? The same thought applies to email. If you write the perfect email with the best call to action and no one opens it, does it really matter? The email body should be sharp, direct, and to the point. It should mimic the conversation you would have with the prospect over the phone. Tell the prospect specifically why you reached out to them. How will engaging with you impact the prospect's life? What is the specific action you would like the person to take? Specific action includes asking for a specific time and date that you would like to meet. If your call to action isn't specific enough, you may risk getting caught up in an email abyss. If the prospect opens your emails, likes what you have to say, and is willing to sit down for a conversation, they will respond to your generic question. Are you available to meet sometime next week? What your generic ask is actually doing is asking the prospect to be to please take some time to review their calendar and choose one of the various open time slots and choose the one that works best for them. This is a lot harder than it sounds, especially for people who have other things to manage in their calendar. Or if the person is hoping you will come back with something more, they may simply respond, yes, I'm available. What's the next move you make? Another emails with a couple choices of dates? What if it takes you too long to respond back to their email and then they come back busy and forget to respond to you? There are way too many uncertainties that could stand in your way and break the momentum you've created with your prospect and you haven't even had the opportunity to meet for the first time. Emails, like calls, should not be overly complicated. Keep them simple. Write one solid email and then copy and paste it over and over again. Change any specific pieces, such as why you directed the email to that person, but the rest of it, including the ask for a meeting date and time, can be the same, especially if you're sending out dozens of emails. You're going to have to have a lot more non-responses than people saying yes, so don't worry about becoming double booked. It will rarely happen, and if it does, let the person know the time they selected was just taken and ask for a phone number to choose the next best time. Remember, you are in control of this process. You are going to send a lot more emails than you would phone calls before you get an initial response. Even with the very best, the average email open rate will be less than 40%. There are some specific email marketers who do claim amazing open rates of closer to 70%. But it's not just about getting the email opened. It's about taking the next step, getting the person to commit to taking action. And that's where the percentages will drop because as much as a third or and more likely closer to only 10% of the people who do open the email will jump at your offering to meet. This is why businesses push to grow email lists. It all comes down to a numbers game. 
My email marketing campaigns average a 40% open rate. And those people have heard of me and have already said, yes, we want to continue to hear from you. My cold emails where I'm sending to someone who has never heard of me before and I'm making a request to meet has a call to action rate closer to 10%. And that's coming from the expert in this space. My pure introduction phone call and response rate is closer to 40%, meaning out of every 10 phone calls of people who've ever heard from me, four of the calls will lead to someone saying, yes, I would love to meet with you. With the same number of people I contact via phone versus email, I receive three more people agreeing to meet when I place the request over the phone. That's a much better return on investment for my time, and it will be for yours too. Using LinkedIn and other social media. LinkedIn has taken off significantly over the last couple of years as the tool to connect with more people, especially those who are in the business to business space. LinkedIn has made it easy to learn all about someone's work history and education and find all their contact details. And yes, LinkedIn is a great way to connect with people you haven't met and with whom you would like to start a business relationship. With any easier form of connection also comes an easier way of ignoring or not responding to the requests. The same way emails are naturally ignored and deleted, the same goes for LinkedIn requests. I have a lot of information out there that recommends always submitting a personalized request when requesting to connect with someone on LinkedIn. And I would agree with that for mo- for the people you purposely want to connect with, those individuals you plan on calling or emailing in the future or have called in the recent past, but go in not expecting a response. LinkedIn makes it too easy to accept or decline a request. And if you do choose to put in a personalized message when sending a request, that message now moves into the recipient's message folder so the recipient may follow up immediately after accepting your request. But changes are constantly happening and what may work today may not work tomorrow. Oftentimes though, people are accepting LinkedIn requests during a busy time in their day and completely forgetting to respond. Therefore, LinkedIn should be used with the intention that you want people to start recognizing you. They see your name and aren't entirely sure where they saw it. And then you do call and they are more likely to accept it because your name now sounds familiar. When I place a LinkedIn request with a limit to the customized request note field, I get right to business. Tell the person the reason you want to connect with them. This is typically your elevator pitch. And then close it with a call to action. Is it a meeting you want? Is it a call? Let the person know what you want them to do. Then leave all your expectations at the door. LinkedIn and all other social media is a pure numbers game. You have to do a lot of it in order to get the responses you're asking for. When someone does respond to you, remember there is another person at the other end. Get to know them and connect with them through a phone call, Skype, or in-person meeting as quickly as possible. Use social media as an extra tool in your toolkit, not as the only tool in your toolkit. You will never be able to build your business as fast as you'd like if you're not willing to step outside your comfort zone and make the phone calls to reach out to more people and let them know why working with you will change their world. What is your intention? Whatever method you decide to reach out to a prospect the very first time, ask yourself, what is the intention of reaching out to them? What do you hope to get? How will you know it was successful? Before reaching out to any prospect and even throughout later meetings, always ask yourself, what is my intention? When I'm speaking on stage, I love asking the audience, what is the intention of a cold call? Usually I get responses such as to get to know more about the other businesses and get the other businesses interested in you or to sell your products and services or to learn more information and so on. Occasionally will I have one person in the audience who actually knows to get the meeting. That's it. The intention of the initial phone call is nothing more than to get the meeting. Unless you are a pure phone salesperson, then your goal may not be to make the sale, but I doubt you will be doing that in your initial outreach to someone who wasn't expecting your call. Almost all companies have websites. And if someone in some information is lacking from their website, you can check out what their social media accounts. If the company is small or privately held, there may not be nearly as much information available as larger publicly traded counterparts, in which case you can have competitive information to get an understanding about the industry landscape and of what smaller companies may need to be aware of. But all of that aside, there is a single goal with the call 
or email or social media reach out. That is to book the meeting. You cannot create high impact relationships and ultimately a high impact sale if you're not moving to high impact connections, such as face-to-face meetings. Later on, as we go through the rest of the sales cycle, the intention will be to understand if the prospect is qualified or determine how they will calculate the return on investment ROI, or to clarify you have everything you need for the proposal and then ultimately close the sale. Know what your intention is for every client interaction and then ask for it you're more likely to get what you want when you know what you want to get.